for coming along. Um, I've got 20 minutes to teach you everything I know about manual handling for office workers and injury prevention from office beyond back care. So we've got all of this stuff will be made available to you afterwards. There'll be a few slides, slides that I skip over because I just really want to sort of concentrate and talk to maybe some higher level staff that, that I think about and I, um, I work to as an exercise physiologist dealing with workplace and injury, injury prevention programs and, and all that sort of stuff. So briefly a bit about me, I think my background in exercise physiology. Um, undergrad in sort of sports science and done a lot of work in clinical rehabilitation. I've worked with athletes for probably the last four or five years. Um, been really, really involved in the design and implementation of health and wellbeing and injury prevention programs on, across workplaces. Um, so what I want to touch on today is when we initially planned this presentation, it was going to be more so aimed at office workers being CBD environment and the potential audience coming along. So we're going to talk about some of the risks of sitting both from a general health perspective and then injury mm -hmm. prevention and musculoskeletal perspective, but then probably spend more time and um, hopefully explain to you at least my thoughts about what we can do to sort of present, prevent musculoskeletal injury, not just in office workers, but across entire working populations. Um, meet your enemy. Who's heard about sitting being the new smoking? I mean, this is really a big message in the public health space at the moment. There's a couple of reasons why it's really at the forefront of what we're talking about as health professionals. Like, we now know that we're spending more time sitting each day than what we actually are sleeping. We can have a whole another conversation how we're not sleeping enough, but as a general rule, we're, we're sitting a lot more than what we do sleep. We often think about sitting behind our desks as a postural hazard from an ergonomic perspective, what stress and strain that's putting on our body and the influence that has on posture and aches and sprains and strains. But we now know with all of the research that premature mortality, heart disease risk and diabetes is really, really closely linked as well. So we probably need to start thinking of a much more of a holistic approach to health and wellbeing and injury prevention when it's specifically around workplace ergonomics and sitting. This here is a really quick little breakdown so we talk about how much sitting we're doing, but then how much sedentary time do we have in general? So if we're sitting for the better part of seven and a half, eight hours a day, and that's sitting at our desk, don't forget how much other time we spend sitting doing other things, driving the car to work, if you've got a long commute, it could be an hour both ways in the morning. Our leisure time seems to be a lot more engineered around sitting on our backsides as well. So in terms of general activity and standing is probably only about three hours a day. So what do we know with the research is that we see cardiovascular disease risk, diabetes risk, and all that really nasty stuff increase when our sedentary time is much more than eight and a half, nine hours a day. So you can see sort of here how easy it is to get 21 hours a day for sedentary time. This slide about the active couch potato, and what I want to highlight here as well is that we know when exercise is important. We talk about getting 30 minutes of exercise each day to reduce our risk of chronic and lifestyle related disease. But three hours of sitting can undo the good work of about half an hour worth of exercise. So if we're barely getting in that half an hour of exercise each day, which I know some people are really struggling with, well, even if we are, the amount of sitting and sedentary time that we're, un we're having is un undermining that anyway. So how's sitting harming our body? We can go over heaps of stuff here. We look at the electrical activity in our muscles, our calorie burning. A really interesting one is about fat enzyme activity. We know that when we're metabolically at very low intensity heart rate, our primary fuel source is fat. And particularly when we're sitting, the enzymes that work to break down fat also become really, really inefficient. HDL cholesterol drops and we look at insulin resistance and diabetes and, and all of the rest of it. So we really do need to stand up more. So how does all of this link into office ergonomics and manual handling? So how do we define manual handling? It's that interaction of our musculoskeletal system with our work environment. Don't just necessarily think lifting. It's all of these things. It's pushing, lifting, throwing, striking, carrying. And if you're working at a desk, it's that interaction with your mouse. It's that interaction with eyes to screen and distance and your seat height. We're going to touch on all that stuff in a minute. I think when we're talking about musculoskeletal injury, particularly in an office environment, the thing that's drawn to mind is back pain. 
and how does back pain occur? Well, more so, let's take a step away from back pain. Let's think about all injuries, shoulders, hips, knees, whatever it may be. The two main factors that cause injury, the two main mechanisms, is either accumulation or a direct trauma. What accounts for most of our injuries in the workplace? Well, that 70% of all our musculoskeletal sprains and strains can be attributed to human factors. So I think often we have this image in our mind of someone doing their back and then you go down and pick up a pen or they sneeze violently and ah, their back goes. Very, very rarely is it that moment or incident that causes that damage. There's a lot of water that's gone under that bridge to get to that point. So I'll highlight some of those things. So if it's the accumulation of lots of small little factors, we probably need to take a much greater and more holistic approach to injury prevention rather than specifically looking at how we're lifting stuff or how we're pushing stuff. What increases our likelihood of injury? Well, first of all, the nature of our work tasks. You might have heard of these as the contributing factors in our workplace. We're going to go over these in a moment. But then we see sedentary lifestyle. Weak core muscular stability of the spine, overweight, obese, other lifestyle-related factors all play into our injury risk. Muscular imbalance is a big one. We can talk about that soon as well. So how do we reduce our risk of injuries? Really important within our, our safety mindset. We need to be ergonomically sound and make sure our contributing factors are as low as possible. Making injury prevention about the individual. And I think we need to, it's, it's becoming more and more mainstream. We're embracing the importance of general health and wellness in the role of overall injury prevention is really, really important. And a big key for me, and where I spend a lot of my time talking to organisations, drawing out programs, it's, it's less about posture and more about movement, particularly functional movement. I look at someone's posture, and for me, that's purely a roadmap of where to start. But I can look at someone's posture and make certain assumptions, but I really can't be clear about what that problem's going to be and how to fix them until I start to see them move. So can we movement assess people to get a clear guidelines for intervening and reducing their personal risk? But the overall, we've got to get people moving more. We've got to get them up and out of their seats, stretching and strengthening much more regularly than what they do. So how can we build this in to our workplace <laughs> environments? First contributing factors, awkward postures, prolonged static load, pressure points, repetitive movements, you guys have probably seen this stuff before, particularly if you're involved in work health and safety space. And it's important to remember that even though we may, not, we may not be physically lifting, moving, pulling things as guys in a warehouse or guys on a work site may be, we're still exposed to a lot of this stuff in a static and sedentary environment. Prolonged static load, sitting is a prolonged static load. The task organisation, how we're looking at our desk and our setup, our positioning of the utensils and tools that we need to access most often. Is that putting repetitive strain on our body? That how how we're getting to those pressure points, the physical contact between wrist and desk, wrist and desk, or back of your thighs and the chair. So all this stuff's still important. Look, I've got a whole come bunch of slides in here about correct ergonomic position. I really don't want to spend too much time on this. I think I can give you guys a resource and a checklist, and you, you're able to work this out. Um, although it really is important, I probably want to flip through this pretty quickly and talk about some higher level stuff in this injury prevention space. So, to get er ergonomically sound, we know what we need to do. Let's go back to this concept of good movement and how can we address that and how we can fix that in people. Muscle balance, as I mentioned before, for me, it's key. Now, at each of our joints, we get ideal length and tension relationships. Some joints are designed to be much more mobile than others, and some joints are primarily need a lot of stability. And we can see a chain and a pattern of stability and mobility across our body. It's about our body working in groups. For example, our ankle is a very mobile joint. It needs a lot of freedom and range of motion. Whereas our knee is a bit of a dumb joint. It works forward and back as a hinge, but doesn't do much more than that. So primary stability. Our hip needs to be very mobile. 
our low back needs stability. So we can look at this chain effect across our whole body and mobility and stability and then assess that. So where do people get hurt? Where do injuries take place? We see the body tends to overcompensate for weaknesses or overworking strong muscles, tight muscles. So a lot of the time we, we notice people with tight backs, we notice people with tight chests and shoulders, they get tight in the joints that ideally should be very mobile joints. Why does that happen? It's the compensation for a lack of stability where we really do need stability. If I see someone with a low back, I'll very rarely look at the back itself as the primary source of its problem. I'll look above and below it. Do we have the appropriate stability to control those joints? Or are we just tightening up at our back to compensate? So it's got to be a big picture. Posture is a good place to start, but we can see the influence of stability once we start to see people move. What we do with our organisation is implement this tool called the Functional Movement Screen. And this is really, really valid for both people that work in very active environments as well as people that work in more sedentary environments. So what we do, we look at a series of movements. We call them fundamental or functional movement patterns. These are key things that most people should be able to do pretty well. Can you squat, can you bend, can you hinge, can you lunge, can you stabilize your trunk, can you control rotation? Not too challenging, but what we can do from there is grade someone's movement capability into a set of criteria, and from there there's plenty of research in this space that we can go <coughs> and assess someone's individual risk of developing musculoskeletal injury. So as a key, so with a keen eye, as an allied health practitioner, I can sit back and probably tell someone after looking at their movement capability, if they're gonna get hurt, where's that likely gonna be before it even happens? The beauty of that is we can then have a very tailored and specific approach to that individual that's preventing their individual injury risk. Where does this fit into other manual handling stuff? I think it's important to have the training and the education about the movement, a good ergonomics, a good policy, but as soon as I interact and engage with an individual and make something very, very specific about them, we see compliance, engagement, and improvement much, much greater. And we've also got a means for reassessment. How do we know the controls or the programs and initiatives we're putting in place to reduce our risk of injuries are actually working? Well, we retest everybody, and people moving better people move better, we know that it's less, there's better muscular balance and biomechanically more sound. Tell me about the time, Sarah. Yeah. Beautiful, we've got heaps of time. Mm -hmm. We've spoken very quickly, which means we have plenty of time for presence and uh, questions at the end as well. So look, to go on with that, to go on with the education, we'll talk about the role of stability within injury prevention as well and core activation core strength is really, really important. I think a lot of the time we, we put programs in place that are very flexibility based and stretching based. And we, we often underplay the role and the need for stability and strength. But as I sort of said before, a lot of the time we see tightness and lack of mobility and stiffness in an individual purely as a result of lack of stability and lack of control somewhere else. So sort of highlight that a little bit more. When we see people dislocate their shoulders when they're out here somewhere, from a football player or a volleyball player or whatever it may be, and that joint's very end range of motion, it takes a lot of stability and control to apply force and work strongly out here. So inherently, if I don't have good stability and control, why would my body even let me get anywhere out there? You're going to restrict the range of motion. So that concept, that principle of this stability mobility continuum exists across most of our joint complexes. All of it sort of linking back to this central point need for core strength and core engagement. If we're not strong here and we're not stable through here in our trunk, everything else is inherently going to lack some stability. So look, we do this little exercise with people all the time to teach them about core engagement and how they can do it in the desks of work as a starting point. So this is where we get interactive. Whatever I want everyone to do is sit themselves up nice and tall for me. Take two fingers, 
and you can build the bony points right on top of your pelvis. Excellent. Bronchial analogy, in and down, about an inch or two. And it's going to seem silly, but what I want you to do in a moment is let out a cough one. Don't do it yet. Because when you do, hopefully what you feel is two little muscular bumps pop up underneath your fingers. Do that now for me. <coughs> As you can see, look at the video later. So what we're feeling for here is some of the muscles that make up our inner core, the ones that stabilize our spine. Now, feeling for those two little points, what I want you to do now is very gently Think about drawing your belly button back towards your spine, or the skin by your belly button away, the belt, away from the belly of your hands. Now, if you're going to control this with a volume dial, do it at a 1 out of 10. Or a 10 out of 10 is very subtle, very soft. Can you feel those little bumps that we felt on our cough just rise and tighten slightly? A few nods, a few maybe. It's not the perfect scenario to try and teach this movement. What we're doing there is we're sort of pre-cueing and pre-activating some of these muscles in through our spine that help stabilise. Now there's lots of different schools of thought about how to best teach core stability and what the different ways to train and improve that is are. This is one way to do it. There are lots of other tricks to, to get there if we want to. So sort of coming back to what we're talking about in the first place, reducing our risk of making us feel better if we're stuck at our desk all day, keeping good posture. Think about this little drawing in the mover as you sit yourself up tall. Give yourself a little bit more stability. It's not the be all and end all of core training, but it's a good place to start. It's important to stretch at your desk though, and again, I don't want to spend too much time going all over this stuff. I make these resources available. I've spoken about being the need to be very specific with our exercise prescription based off an individual's need from that movement screen. But then again, there is some stuff that we most people pretty safely that they can do at their desks based on what we know about those, those common ergonomic problems, the common stiffnesses and tightnesses that we do see from being stuck at a desk all day. Neck, chest, hamstring, glutes, low back. As I said, I'll make all of this stuff available to you as well. But as I said, it's not just about strength and stretching, strength and getting important as well. These are all ways to get people up and out of their desk and moving more reducing their risk of some of those metabolic conditions we spoke about at the start of today, but also working on specific injury prevention as well. Thank you. <coughs> so look, it's a flying look and hopefully there's lots of questions, but for some reason, sitting is killing us, and sedentary time is killing us, and we need to make changes there. We need to recognise those contributing factors, put the appropriate safety and ergonomics and controls in our workplace to reduce the influence of those, but really take the next step and how do we prevent stuff from happening before it even really happens? <coughs> Stretching, strengthening, and assessing someone's movement capability and muscular balance is a really good way to do that. Stand up more. Get away from your chair. So look, that's the organisation I work for, all corporate bodies international. I don't want to today to be about them or us, it's more so as me, an allied health professional, as an exercise physiologist. If you've got any more questions, I suppose, about what we do, feel free to have a chat afterwards. Has anyone got any questions about what's been today's presentation? Yes? It's sort of related. I, I was just talking to a new a work health and safety person, and yeah. I said, I reckon we should have a lunchtime Pilates class. Yeah, excellent. Um, because it is problematic, and a lot of people are starting to use those stand up desks. Yeah, the very desks, they're great. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but I haven't looked into cost or anything, I don't know how mm. that works. But Yeah, look, Pilates classes or those sort of classes are great at work for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, can be built into a sort of a greater wellness program, a greater initiative, but I suppose. If you're doing some stuff about specifically reducing, reducing musculoskeletal risk, that sort of class environment is a really, really good way to probably more intimately teach and properly teach some of this core activation stuff that I've poorly tried to teach in, a, in the sitting the setting here. So if, you, if you're going down that route of looking at ergonomics and injury prevention and how we can supplement this with some activity-based stuff, that could be a really, really good mm -hmm. um, option. Just on those very desks as well, I reckon they're great. We've been talking to a few companies recently sort of moving away from that 
typical office environment to an activity-based workspace. Everyone lives out of lockers now. They've got to find a desk each day. Um, encourages much more movement. Encourages much more interaction and productivity increases as well. But the only catch that I'll say with those variable desks, if you're going to use them and implement them, don't expect people to go from sitting to standing straight away. It just cause just as many problems. The, the key is small bouts of standing. The best situations or environments where I've seen that stuff brought in is when people sort of hop desk into a standing environment and have the opportunity to stand up for 15, 20 minutes a day. It's great. I, we've got a couple in our other offices around the, around the country and I'm sort of, if I get lose concentration or bored or foggy, I'll log off and go and stand up desk for 15, 20 minutes and sort of reinvigorate them and break some of that sitting time. It's great. They're about 500 off the internet. So oh, okay. They're quite, and what our property area like about them, and it doesn't mean you change the workstation, you know how they're very precious about you changing the workstation. Mm -hmm. It literally sits on sits top. On top. Yeah. Yeah. What about the, like I know factory workers and a friend of mine, who she was quite young, got really bad varicose veins. Yeah. And that's from standing all day, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, and I sort of so it's hard to have too much for the thing, but there's probably so much more that goes into that Balance. element. And just, just that standing, and I suppose that's why you're looking for things like the fatigue they have underneath and in general, like various veins, blood flow and venous return and blood supply to the body as well. It's probably multifactorial, um, sort of promoting the importance of, of exercise and moving on top of all of those things. It's a key underpinning them, looking after the healthy people. Right, I've seen one of those little treadmills sort of yeah. things that you put under your desk and you're yeah. actually cycling <laughs> as you... Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. What do you think of them? They're not too bad. Anything that's going to encourage and promote movement, and obviously electrical stimulation is going to raise your metabolism. You have to watch your knees don't well. you kick yeah, yeah. Exactly right. It's really interesting. I'm not sure if you've seen them as well. They've actually got treadmill-based desks as well. So you've got the workstation with a treadmill and you set it at very, very low speeds. You've actually got people walking. Um, great for promoting this idea of physical activity and movement. But I mean, they did a study that looked at typing speed, their form of efficiency, um, and it drops a bit. Mm -hmm. So it's that catch-22 balance. Do we want people up and moving and supporting this active workplace? And where's the fine line on that? Actually ensuring productivity level stay um, the same. But I suppose that if you take a long-term effect, those people are moving more, and they're generally going to have better brain function mm -hmm. throughout the day, more active, more engaged with their workplace. I was wondering if you knew of an app or something that would serve as a reminder throughout yeah. the day if a person needed to stand yeah. up or clench their muscles or something. I think this whole space of wearable technology and healthy fitness is excellent. Um, I, yeah. I believe now some of the things like Fitbits and apps and phones, they'll vibrate. They can do that a lot if you have a sedentary. The Tubong in particular, the Fitbits also sort of track your steps. We took about 10,000 steps a day being really important. And if you sort of lag behind it where you should be for that time of day, or you could put a vibration on the wrist and tell you to go and get up and moving. Um, really simple, cost effective things that you can do. Um, we do most of our work on a cloud based system, so we get a generic screen saver for, for everyone. Um, and on that, when was the last time that you stood up? How you stood up within the last 30 minutes? So every time I'm changing between windows, it's telling me I'm <laughs> sitting down for too long. Um, so yeah, that integration of some of the wearable technology is definitely a really interesting space. Mm -hmm. um, there's a really good conference or an event coming up at the convention centre being held by the Workplace Health Association of Australia. It's in August, and that's all about the integration or the, the use of new technologies in this workplace health space. So we some more information about that in the future as well. Brett, I, I saw a great idea. I was in Europe recently, and in airports and particularly train stations, they have little pods where you recharge your phone on a little um, bicycle kind yeah, of uh, scenario, <laughs> like the lab rat scenario. Yeah. And I, I thought at the time that would be a great idea for an office, like in the lunchroom, you know. It's the middle of mm -hmm. winter, people don't necessarily want to go out, but they're, they're standing around or sitting around and chatting. Well, stand around, and it was at this height yeah. for standing, chatting to the person who's sitting, Moving doing around. this. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I thought it was a great idea. I have um, no, 
no idea of costs, but all, all um, really, really good ideas. So I suppose some considerations about that. So because we, we work with WHS and HR to so help them you know, get help and wellbeing stuff up on the ground. I think some of the resistance that we run into a lot of the time about bringing exercise equipment into a workplace is how do people safely use it and what is the risk and all those sorts of things. But there's plenty of checks you can sort of put in place. Sure, you've done a pre exercise screen, and people have got instructions that they're not going to have a heart attack, and all of the rest of it. But you know, I agree, if you can build in ways to encourage people to move more, almost help by stealth, it's a great little line that I heard the other day. Definitely do it. Just to go on from that as well, I forget exactly what country it was, I think it was one of the Scandinavian ones, but amongst their public health system, sorry, their public transport system, a little iPad style video camera at your, your ticket booth. And you can get a free single trip ride on one of the buses or the trains if you do 20 squats in front of it. So it's encouraging people to move. So the cost of giving a free bus ticket versus the long term health cost to society of people not exercising enough. I think that's a great idea. I have a chat to DPTI about their races. <laughs> Does anybody have anyone, anything else? So the. When you have a stand-up desk, yeah. someone told me that the mats you get with it are designed to make you move from neck yeah. to neck. So um, right. Look, I think sometimes I'll put I it like that anti-fatigue mat mm -hmm. underneath to sort of take stress off joints of feet and arches, similar to what Woolies or Coles would have behind their checkouts if their people are going to be on their feet all day. So I suppose that's a risk mitigation tactic for people transitioning from sitting all day to, to standing up. In terms of that side to side from a stability element, it's probably not designed to do um, a lot of that. But yeah, of course, when we've been talking about helping people design these, these active workspaces, that's mm -hmm. been a consideration. And what are they called? Well. Anti-fatigue matting or fatigue matting. Okay, well, thank you.